Okay, I guess we're gonna get started. Can you hear me okay? Yes? All right, and now for something completely different. Uh, let's see here. Oops. I'm going to discuss two digital archive projects this morning. One entitled Street Art Graphics is a digital archive of stickers and other street-based ephemera from around the world. The other entitled People's History Archive was created for many online exhibits with interpretive analysis based on items from the Street Art Graphics Digital Archive. I'll show ways in which these two projects have been incorporated into research and course-related assignments at St. Lawrence University, where I work as gallery director, and into gallery exhibitions at SLU and elsewhere. I will also discuss how the Street Art Graphics Project is growing in collaboration with an investigative citizen journalism, journalism group blog called The Weave. Hold on, I'm grabbing my pen here. <clears throat> At the beginning, I typically like to describe street art stickers for people who may be not aware of them, especially because stickers are somewhat less common in urban centers outside of the United States. In the last 25 years, street art has evolved dramatically from the aerosol and painted mural graffiti that peppered subway stations back alleys and train yards. Street art stickers have emerged as <laughs> for self-expression and as, as an effective way to engage passers-by. I call them creative disruptions of everyday life. Stickers may be used to tag a space and make it temporarily one's own, to sell products or services, to publicize social media sites, or to offer political commentary and critique. As one of the most democratic art forms, Stickers can be printed on paper or vinyl and can be distributed quickly, cheaply, and widely. Measuring around two by two to three by four inches, stickers are hidden in plain sight on street signs, telephone poles, dumpsters, and windows. And although ephemeral by nature, stickers capture the creative, cultural, and political pulse of time and place. My own research focuses on political stickers, which I find at info shops, squats, alternative and anarchist book fairs, zine fests, and May Day street rallies, like the one pictured in Berlin on the lower left. One year I sent a student studying in England to the London anarchist book fair, and he said it was the largest group of skanks he'd ever come across. <laughs> he was a good sport about it though, and brought back a few dozen British stickers for me. People have also contacted me through conferences, my Sticker Kitty research blog, Facebook, and other social media sites. In the last year, artists and collectors from Germany, Canada, and Indonesia wrote to me and sent new stickers to add to the archive. That was be me when I was much younger. <laughs> um. Of the 11,000 or so stickers in my collection, roughly 2,700 have been individually scanned and cataloged for the Street Art Graphics Digital Archive which can be accessed on the SLU uh, Art Gallery website, and you'll see on the left, uh, it's in Content DM and Shared Shelf Commons. The original archive was initiated in 2004 in Content DM. In 2015, as part of a four-year initiative, the U.S. Council of Independent Colleges selected the collection as one of 47 projects across the country to be included in Art Store's Shared Shelf Commons, a free open access library of digital images and a web-based service for cataloging and managing digital collections. My implementation manager, Zhao Li Ma, is actually here today. Thank you. And I owe her and her team a big thanks for their expertise and support. We're now in the process of migrating the collection to Shared Shelf Commons. So as I said, if you go to the SLU Gallery's website, you'll see the archive listed in both platforms. With Xiao Li's help, the Street Art Graphics Archive now feeds into the Digital Public Library of America as of about two weeks ago, and we're really psyched. And about 500 items have been published to date. Beyond the 2,700 items in Content DM that will be migrated to Shared Shelf Commons, we expect to scan and catalog an additional several, several hundred items in the next three years during the con consortium grant. 
I'm going to talk briefly about the cataloging we do, which I try to incorporate into the curriculum or to develop as an independent student research project. Cataloging strategies have evolved over the past decade, but we've come up with these four fairly successful models, including the curating that I do on selected projects, cataloging done by the arts uh, metadata technician, sexy job title, she loves that one, student cataloging projects that range from individual students who want to do independent research to students in courses who are fulfilling writing assignments. And last, a special project called Weaving the Streets and People's History Archive, made possible through a five-year Andrew W. Mellon Humanities Grant to St. Lawrence called Crossing Boundaries, Re-Envisioning the Humanities in the 21st Century. And I'll give brief descriptions of some of the projects uh, and range of work being done. The earliest U.S. stickers in the archive were produced by the industrial workers of the world dating to the 1910s. Known at the time as stickerettes or silent agitators, they were printed and sold by the millions, yet relatively few examples remain today in university libraries and special collections. As I mentioned before, uh, most of the research I do appears on my Sticker Kitty blog, though I created one exhibit for the new People's History Archive website as a model to show to students. I've also done research on American civil rights era stickers that were called Night Raiders, shown here. And typically, the research and writing I do appears um, or is added under the description field or one called Curator's Notes. The arts metadata technician then creates subject headings using a combination of authority records from the Library of Congress, the Gettys Art and Arch Architecture Thesaurus, and Union List of Artist Names and other resources. The next two examples were created as student independent research projects at their request. At this, and at this time, there are about 100 items in the archive that I don't own myself, but they were so unusual that I made exceptions. In the spring of 2013, for example, I came across a rare collection of German political stickers called Spookies, dating from the fall of the Berlin Wall. The Spookies are archived at a squat in former East Berlin. I was given permission to scan the items that summer and in the fall, one of my students, Carolyn Dellinger, helped catalog them. For this project, we came up with standard Excel spreadsheet with 28 different metadata fields for each item uh, for things like contributor, source, date, geographic location, et cetera. Carolyn's job was to edit the image files in Photoshop and to create metadata for title, title translation, and description fields. Her metadata was normalized and refined, and Arlene created subject headings using the combination of controlled co vocabularies that I listed before. For another project in 2014, a student, Rebecca Clayman, cataloged a set of four Egyptian stickers from the Arab Spring uprisings in 2011. In this case, she interviewed a faculty member in our Modern Languages Department to translate the text on each sticker from Arabic into English. For two semesters, I have worked with a Spanish professor, Marina Lorente, on a writing assignment in which her advanced seminar students analyzed and wrote short, concise, bilingual Spanish and English descriptions about stickers from different regions in Spain dating from the late 1970s to present day. Um, early stickers in the collection celebrated the Spanish Constitution of 1978, like the one on the upper left, while more contemporary stickers focused on the country's economic crisis environmental issues, unions and workers' rights, gender and sexuality, and the ongoing Catalan independence movement. The first step of the writing assignment involved teaching students how to annotate the images and identify all of the uh, textual and visual elements represented in the, each item. The first year we did this, we didn't, the students did not do that and their writing suffered as a result. They, they weren't paying attention to all of the different elements. Students would then do research to figure out what each element signified. The second part of the assignment asked students to use what they learned through the annotations to come up with a final analysis for each sticker. <coughs> students needed to outline issues that were being represented, provide historical and cultural context, and determine how text and images were combined to create meaning. 
The students who annotated the images and followed the steps closely did well on the assignment. Um, and similar to the workflow I described previously for the other cataloging projects, I'm now handing over the metadata, uh, various metadata fields to Arlene who will polish the metadata and create subject headings for each item. This, there's a lot of text on that one, sorry. So the Weaving the Streets um, and People's Archive project is a recently launched four-year educational initiative at St. Lawrence that was designed to document the often fleeting and relatively unnoticed cultural and political expressions that, takes, that take place in public spaces. WISPA brings together an investigative citizen journalism group blog at SLU called The Weave and, and the Street Art Graphics digital archive of mine. The Weave was created in 2006 by John Collins, a professor in global studies, and some of his students to examine underreported stories in mainstream media, focusing on environmental issues, gender and sexuality, human rights, media and technology, and social change. John describes the weave as the process and product of weaving together texts and contexts. The weaving the streets component of the project offers students and young alumni studying off campus the opportunity to contribute blog posts and born digital photographs regarding issues facing contemporary societies. And this student had collected, which one is this one? I think this is the one from, yeah, from New York City, items from New York City. Um, participants also, uh, for the second component of the project, participants also contribute two to five physical items that are scanned and cataloged for the new People's History Archive, which also features an interactive timeline and map. One challenge for all of us has been to think through what sorts of items belong in a People's Archive. We didn't want to predefine it, but rather let it grow organically from the ground up. To date, items include a voucher for free pa paella at a Madrid hostel on the lower left, uh, a flyer from the 2014 People's Climate March in New York City, a business card for a cafe in Costa Rica that allows philanthropic customers to purchase cafe pendiente or free pending coffee for the next customer, and a mysterious Queen of Hearts tarot playing card from 1914 that is ripped right across the Queen's head. What's been fascinating to see in this project is how much is revealed in the student selection. The student who submitted the Queen of Hearts card on the right also submitted the other images on the right, a card from a woman's body empowerment workshop she had taken and a bookmark uh, of, for a book about burlesque after taking classes with the author. If you think about how collections and archives tell stories, even many cur curated collections like this one tells a story of feminine power and sexuality through the eyes of a 20-year-old. That was the story this student wanted to tell. That's a quick um, snapshot of the interactive map. You can zoom in and out. So also part of the People's History Archive here. This next project was done by Laurel Hurd a global studies and Spanish double major who received a, a, a research fellowship at SLU last summer. Laurel, now a senior, cataloged nearly 70 sticker, stickers from Spain and created four mini online exhibits on feminism and democratic Spain, Spain's energy and the environment, trade unions during Spain's economic, economic crisis, and the Catalan independence movement. Laurel was the first student to contribute to the People's History Archive, and her work serves as an excellent model for other students. I'll briefly describe a couple of exhibitions I put together on, these, um, on the sticker collection. Um, after working with Marina's uh, Spanish class in the fall of 2012, we presented Pegatinas Politicas at SLU the following spring. So the exhibition featured the Spanish stickers that her students had analyzed and written about, and the students' bilingual description fields were used as exhibi uh, exhibition text panels up on the wall. It was very text heavy. It was good, though. I'm also um, collaborating with a German curator and collector on a traveling exhibition called Rewriting the Streets, the International Language of Stickers. Oliver Baudact is the founder and director of Hatch Kingdom Sticker Museum in Berlin, the world's first museum devoted to this genre. His collection of over 2,500 25, stickers is geared toward artists, 
um, character design, streetwear, skate decks, music, and punk culture. My contribution to the exhibition consists of political stickers from North America and Europe focusing on animal rights, consumer capitalism, the environment, immigration, surveillance, and war. And um, in 2014 and 2015, I presented two exhibitions at Hatch Kingdom called Paper Bullets. And here's a photo from the first show. <coughs> art galleries, in conclusion, um, art galleries, museums, libraries, and archives share much in common, especially in the digital world. And these recent publications, some from Library Juice Press, have dominated my reading lately. In information literacy and social justice, um, radical professional practice, Henry Giroud describes how, quote, critical pedagogy shifts how students think about the issues affecting their lives and the world at large, potentially energizing them to seize such moments as possibilities for acting out on the world and for engaging it as a matter of politics, power, and social justice. The appeal here is not merely to an individual sense of ethics, it is also an appeal to collectively address material inequities involving resources, accessibility, and power in both education and the broader global society, while viewing the struggle for power as generative and crucial to any viable notion of individual and social agency." End quote. <clears throat> in, a in a university context, I'm able to integrate the street art graphics digital archive and the People's History Archive into the curriculum or co-curricular projects through student independent research projects, writing assignments, summer fellowships, and exhibitions. Students learn how to analyze and interpret images and situate them in social historical contexts, improve their own writing skills, and gain, gain a better understanding of technology and its real world applications. I also believe that I am preserving history by archiving the ephemera of our day Every sticker tells a story, and it's my job to make a note of it. I call myself the studs turkle of the sticker world, creating archives of stories by and about the people. That's the function of these archives. Thank you. <laughs> and I think we're going to go to the next uh, presentation and do questions at the end. Screen up. Where's the mouse? Good morning, everybody. I'm Karen Cariani from WGBH, and myself and Alan Gevinson from the Library of Congress are going to talk to you this morning about the American Archive of Public Broadcasting and how to make a large media collection accessible on the web and accessible in general. Um, so our goal is not only to provide access to the, and discoverability to the collection, but also long-term preservation. So we're a little bit different than the DPLA in that we're not provide, just providing access, we're actually preserving digital objects. Uh, the initial collection consists of 40,000 hours of digital media from over 100 public media stations across the country, both TV and radio. 5,000 hours were ingested as already existing digital files, and the rest were created as a large analog to digital digitization project with a single vendor. Through an inventory project, we collected 2.5 million records from about 120 stations across the country. These are not full catalog records, but inventories that were, that were identifying that a physical object actually existed in an, in an archive or a location. Um, and, that, and what the format of that object was. So was it a file or was it a tape and what was the format of the tape? 
In addition, we know that there are over three million items sitting at stations, archives, universities, libraries, independent producers across the country, which we have not even tapped into yet. The entire digitized collection is accessible on location at WGBH and at the Library of Congress Reading Room. About 12,000 items are available anywhere in the United States via the website. So the additional, and the additional 2.5 million inventory records, metadata only, are also available on the website. There are four curated exhibits at the moment and more to come. Um, that helps highlight items within the collection. Since it's a large, voluminous collection, we figured curated collections would help us um, pull specific items out and highlight them. And there's another one that are, that's coming. So that's supposed to help materials that may be hard to find in the volume of material. Oh, you know, I, sorry, that was that, right, that was that slide. So this is talking about all of the materials that we got in the curated exhibits. I have to remember to click my slides. I was supposed to be racing through this because I only had six minutes and now I have all this luxury of time so I'm like trying to slow down. <laughs> uh, um, uh, and PB Core. So uh, one of the other responsibilities of uh, the American Archive is the further development of PB Core. And PB Core is a metadata schema that was geared towards public media and audiovisual collections. We've actually found that more uh, archives and libraries that have audiovisual collections have adopted it than actual the public media stations. Um, and it's mostly because it's very good at describing AV collections. Um, in particular, we're hoping to map a similar schema that's going on in Europe called EBU Core to PB Core so that PB Core users can take advantage of the RDF ontology that EBU Core um, has already developed so that we're not redeveloping an a very similar ontology and going through that work. We're going to crosswalk from uh, PB Core to EBU Core. Um, the challenges of access for a large media collection are numerous. Um, certainly access to analog media is becoming more and more difficult as formats become obsolete so, and, and fragile. So it's harder and harder just to look at the item itself. However, with digital files and the functionality of websites, technical, technical as access is becoming much, much easier. It's much easier to watch a streaming video file on the web than it is to actually pull a two-inch tape off a deck, off, uh, out of a vault and put it up on a deck and get an engineer to play it for you. Um, and it usually, the, our, our challenges and issues usually boil down to legal and rights issues, partly because um, access becomes broader and much more public, so you're much more at risk and exposed. So we ask ourselves, what do we have the rights to make accessible? And of the analog t material, what's affordable to digitize and put on the web? Complicating the matter is that we don't necessarily own the rights to all the content, and neither does the donor who has given us the material. And often we don't know who does own the rights. And the rights are more complicated than just the ownership of that actual item and the copyright of that actual item, because there may be other third-party materials within the media piece that there are additional copyright issues or talent issues, which gets into talent uh, bargaining units. So it's often a risk assessment for us. How much can we rely on the law that, that grants certain rights to libraries and archives to allow access? And how much, is it, how much are we at risk? Who would actually care enough to bring a legal case against us? And of course, in the larger collection, it means that there's more data for archi archives to process and make decisions and users to scroll through. So fully cataloging the media means watching or listening to each item, in order, which is very, very labor intensive, in which we, we don't have the staffing and resources to actually do. So, oops. So we've launched our website, and we chose to explore all the data that we had, regardless of how complete it was. The items with better data will show up in refined searches. The items with not so great data may seem like clutter to some people researching the collection, but to others it may actually pique their interest. It may be enough of a spur for them to actually want to see the object. We've developed some screens to facet the searches so that the, perhaps there's less clutter and the user can choose how much they want to see and how further, much deeper they want to go into the collection. But the goal was really to get the user to the content as quickly as possible. Uh, this is our technology stack, and I'm happy to, to talk about it deeper a little bit later. Um, we, we stream the audio and the video. We're using um, PB Core and Solar to index the data, and Blacklight's our interface that's um, managing the web images. And all of our code is in GitHub, if anybody's interested. So metadata. Again, PB Core. Um, we're using PB Core as our metadata scheme. It manages our descriptive, administrative, technical instantiations, and extensions. Uh, this is the AMS, which is our uh, kind of our content management system that allows um, 
It allows our uh, stations to log in and access their own materials and upload data and change data. It was developed by um, AVPS in New York. It stores technical and preservation metadata. It allows our digitization vendors to upload um, their technical data and their preservation data, and, the, and we also get our proxies through them. Um, it provides PB Core and Premise REST APIs so that we can export all the data as PB Core. So to fully catalog the whole collection, we figured it would take one person 32 years, and we can't afford to hire an army of catalogers to do it, and nor do we want to wait before we, for the material to be fully cataloged before we make it accessible. So we decided to tack the, tackle the problem by cleaning up the data as quickly as possible and doing a minimum level of cataloging, which um, my staff has now deemed to be termed MVC. <laughs> um, and it's to allow better discoverability and some sense of what the content is. We spend no more than 15 minutes per item grabbing key data like verifying the title, the credits, noting if there's a date anywhere, if there's a copyright notice, if there's a date on the copyright notice, any really quick information that we can get that would give us some more core um, notion of what this item is. Um, even with this minimum data, it would take us about six years to complete the whole collection, and it is growing every year, so we would always be behind. Um, so we're, we're all planning on volunteering after we retire to help continue to catalog. <laughs> um, we do have an army of interns. Um, we work very closely with Simmons um, Library Science School um, for an army, and actually some of them are here in the audience, and they're going to present next uh, on something else, but they're going to present. But um, they come in and they do an awesome, awesome job looking at the items and helping us catalog and helping us get more and more information out there. Um, this is the list of metadata that we expose to our users. Um, it's the list on the left. On the left, yes. Um, those are all the, the basic core uh, data items that we expose. Uh, we've designed the search to be as Google-like as possible to make it easy. We have a map visualization so that users can explore by state or by organization. And we've thrown items into broad categories based purely on index terms. So we've done, Solar has done a major index of all of the, or the, what little cataloging we have, and it's been pulling out keywords within that, um, that index, and then we've popped them into these categories as a result of that. Um, it's not based on any real cataloging unless the item actually has been cataloged. So there may be some clutter in these categories. For example, drama. You might not necessarily just find dramas in the drama category because there may be the word drama in one of the titles. But at least it's something to help you guide through the large collection. Uh, the facets. Um, uh, allow users to narrow down their search results. Um, I only want to see items that are digitized and streaming, or I only want to see items that uh, are available in the online reading room. Speaking of the online reading room, here we are, and Alan's going to pick it up from here. Um, I'm going to talk about the online reading room and, and a bit about the content. Uh, of this collection. So since October uh, 2015, we've launched our online reading room to include programs that we've determined may prudently be streamed for educational and scholarly purposes to users who agree to stipulated rules of use. A year earlier, staff and legal teams from WGBH and the Library of Congress and the um, Harvard Law School Cyber, Cyber Law Clinic um, from the Berkman Center for Internet and Society. Uh, we all met for an intensive two-day series of meetings to discuss, discuss issues relating to online access. And over the next year, we had me weekly telephone conversations and we developed a plan to work out uh, the challenges that we faced. First, we reviewed existing agreements and asked each station to sign a release form with the understanding that third parties might retain rights to some of the materials. Some 75% of the stations and archives have signed the form. Next, we determined that, oops. Next, we determined that streaming certain types of programs for educational purposes constitute a tran uh, transformational use a key concept for fair use determinations. News reports, for example, offered at the time of their broadcast 
timely factual information to contemporary audiences. Today, however, they no longer have that use. Instead, the same broadcasts can provide scholars with information about how the media reported factual information and opinions, and consequently how segments of society may have per perceived the events, issues, people, policies, and views included. There's much more that we've taken into consideration, of course, but transformational use is at the core of our reasoning. Our complete collection includes content from 38 states and two non-states, District of Columbia and Guam. There are 12 states uh, that, have, um, that did not participate as yet and we're trying to target them for future um, growth. The Northeast, Mid-Atlantic, Mid and Midwest regions account for nearly three quarters of the total number of files. We currently have metadata that includes dates for 44% of the total collection. Programs produced since 1990 account for more than half of the dated material, while the 50s, 60s, and 70s together account for only one quarter of the to total. Places and years thus are skewed, favoring some states, some regions, and some decades over others. But even with these imbalances, this remains an extraordinarily diverse collection of programming covering many localities and much that occurred during the past 60 plus years. Because of the ge geographic breadth of the material, researchers can use the collection to help uncover ways that national and even global processes played out on the local scene. The long chronological reach going from the 50s to, I think, 2013 is our most current uh, program. This will supply researchers with previously inaccessible primary source material to document change over time. Scholars who have supported our work have repeatedly complained about lack of access. A historian of the civil rights movement has stated, I have long been frustrated by the difficulty of gaining access to the vast audiovisual record of my period. A media historian writes that bringing public, public broadcasting programs out of obscurity would be an immense boon to scholars, not only of media history, but of the era as well. The material is especially important because of the era it reflects. There remains much basic excavation and interpretive work in recent American history for the present generation of scholars to accomplish. A recent essay uh, from the uh, American Historical Association noted that American history scholarship pertaining to the period of 1973 onwards is limited, fragmentary, and politically conflicted. Accounts about later periods, the author concluded, have not really been history. The American Archive Collection contains a wealth of material produced locally for local audiences. These programs represent an untapped important source, resource. During the 1960s and 70s, many historians began to focus on social history, history from the bottom up, instead of on national elites. This emphasis on diversity, Alan Brinkley has written, presumed that the history of the nation is many different stories no one of which can be considered the main story. More recently, some historians have advocated for integrating the national story into wider contexts. The goal is to relate national experiences to larger processes and also to local resolutions. The history of the civil rights movement provides a good example of the importance of local studies. The publication in the mid-1990s of a number of key works on local civil rights history marked a major shift in the field, historian Emily Crosby has written. Collectively, she states, these books highlighted how acknowledging and studying the importance of the movement's local indigenous base fundamentally alters our picture of the movement and its significance. The materials in our collection are rich in primary source material documenting 
the Southern Civil Rights Movement in interviews, speeches, and lectures. And we've developed a special curated exhibit on that topic to collect these programs into one spot. We currently are exposing ways to better identify, tag, and display content on a variety of public affairs themes. With funding from IMLS, we've begun working with the pop-up archive to create transcripts of programs. We plan to enlist subject matter specialists to work with information technology experts to help us find productive ways to query the database of transcripts, to organize metadata, and to display results so that users could access topically organized material from various localities and time periods. Last, I want to highlight our goal of providing a central web po portal of discovery where researchers, educators, students, really anyone can go in order to find relevant materials and link directly to them. From the standpoint of a scholar interested in researching how a national or even international topic was covered by public media in divergent localities, one access portal, portal will save researchers a lot of time. AAPB has made a start at becoming that portal. We hope stations and archives that have their own websites will send us metadata so that we can provide direct links to digitized files on their, on their sites. For a researcher, searching at one web portal across collections would be one-stop shopping. This is what the DPLA has been doing, and we plan in the future on making AAPB metadata and files accessible through searches on the DPLA website as well as on our own. We want to help solve the separate silos syndrome. Thank you. If there's any questions, you can come to either the microphones on either side of this of the auditorium. because it's being recorded. I can grab one. For the folks recording uh, the uh, public TV content, how, are you coordinating your, your work with the Internet Archive and the, the uh, work they're doing in, in archiving a lot of the um, broadcast TV as well? Because I, I believe they're also uh, archiving um, public TV. So I think what they're doing is grabbing things off air. Aren't they recording off air right. as things are being broadcast now? So what our, fo <laughs> what our, what our focus is right now is um, the older material that's sitting in archives and under desks and in libraries. And, um, and so we're, our focus right now is to get that ops the older material that's dying and deteriorating digitized and into a digital form and then upload it here. I think actually that's a great idea um, in how we might work with them to get their data into one portal, but I think they're they're feeding into the DPLA, right? So we're going to have some duplication yeah, that, of efforts sense. there that we're going to have to try to figure out how to do that. So I would say most of our collection ends in 2010. Uh, 2010. We, we go up to 2013. Yeah. So we're not we're so we're not as up to date as they are. They're taking the broadcast off air, and we aren't tackling that. Thank goodness. Okay. <laughs> so, but that's a good point. We ought to actually talk to them and try to figure out how to work with them. And as Karen said earlier, um, we're not just about access, we're about preservation. So we, we do try to get master material, not off our air um, copies. Yes, it is. Very yes. Much. Um, you mentioned working with Pop-Up Archive on transcripts. Um, I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about, um, do you see a future for automation to help with some of the description, mm -hmm. and how far away is that? Are we five years out, or is it something we can start doing immediately in terms of both transcripts, but also subjects and recognizing images and things like that? Uh, so, funny you should ask that. <laughs> um, um, because we do think, because we have this really large collection that's going to take 
so much effort to catalog that the best way to do is to use machine and automated tools to help us do as much as we can as quickly as we can. Uh, the pop-up archive is a speech-to-text tool that they're running all the audio through. Uh, we know it's not going to be 100% accurate, so we're building a metadata game similar to what the New York Public Library has done to have the crowd, the public, help us correct those transcripts. So that's a, a test case. IMS has funded that project, and we'll, we'll see how that goes. We've also submitted a grant to uh, NEH Digital Humanities. We haven't heard yet, so we don't, we don't know. But the idea being to take those same transcripts, run them through other computational tools, and pull out keywords. And then working with uh, historians to help us figure out Okay, those keywords that are coming up in speech, how might you topic, topicalize them? I just made that up. <laughs> or make them into themes so that then you could actually tag or annotate the items with those broader themes that people might relate to in searching. So that's one thing that we're, we're trying to do. I know um, the folks in Europe um, at the University of Amsterdam and Institute of Sound and Vision are, are working on a lot of speech uh, audio recognition and um, scene recognition. So, you know. They've, I think they've already got it down where the, when you can tell when a shot changes, but then the shot changes and then do you know what the shot is and how do you add context to that? And I'm not quite sure how far away that is and I think um, people are working on that. Um, also part of our pop-up archive grant is to build an audio um, sound fingerprint database of audio signals. So for example, if we've identified Richard Nixon talking in an item and then any time that audio pattern shows up again, they can tag that as Richard Nixon. So we'll see, we'll see if that works and what happens with that. But um, I think the image recognition is stronger around pictures and images and not so much with moving images because it's a little complicated. So. That's really exciting. Thank you. Thank you. I have a question for Kathy. So um, you showed us the two exhibitions and the collection you built in the um, university, university setting. So for you, what is the biggest challenges to carry on digital um, project like that? Um, it's hard at this point when students are cataloging, you know, real qualitative cataloging, not, you know, the easy cataloging. What's slowing us down is the editing of that and polishing it and getting it into our shared shelf commons quickly. So right now I'm backlogged with scores of student, you know, short texts. So that's one issue that we need to figure out. Um, but what, I, I, what I'm thinking of doing is, and I like your MGI thing, <laughs> you know, where, where we enter, where we can add a lot of images. You know, I have up to 11 or 12,000 with what is the minimum amount of data, metadata required to get everything in and then go back and do the qualitative metadata in, in as like curated exhibitions. And so that's my thinking at this point. Okay. I don't know if it's right, but that's, if, unless anyone has any great ideas. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.